Hey, everyone. My name is Eric Jones, better known as the Turf Teacher. Welcome to the course entitled Pesticides in the Environment and Landscape. This course has been given course number 2683 by the North Carolina Landscape Contractors Licensing Board for one technical or landscape credit towards your license renewal of July 31st, 2024. So welcome. Welcome to the course. This is a course that I teach uh, at the college. Uh, it is a course near and dear to my heart uh, because we are actively engaged in the um, business of applying pesticides. And, you know, I learned early on in college from uh, Dr. Ware at uh, North Carolina A&T State University. She told us, she told our class, she said, you guys are stewards of the land. And I really took that to heart, uh, meaning that we're in the green industry, guys. We're, we're here because we already want to take care of the environment and to take care of our clients' properties. Uh, so we're doing the right thing. We're getting our continuing education, not only in landscape contracting, uh, but the other landscape license that we have. Uh, the green industry is full of them. So what it is, is you have to take personal responsibility for you and your employees that are out there spraying these pesticides. And they must protect our environment and they must protect the landscapes that we are working on for our clients. And so, um, you know, rules and regulations have to be followed and not only uh, do we need to read the label each and every time we're applying these pesticides, we must do the right thing with calibrating our equipment on a daily basis, uh, not only on a daily basis, but maybe multiple times during the day. So um, this is what this course was put together for. It's protecting the environment, it's protecting the landscape, and it's just good information. So remember, it is good only for one NCLCLB credit. A lot of these courses are approved for pesticides uh, if they are taken in the live format, meaning that you guys come to one of my face-to-face -face classes. I have zero classes approved uh, by the Department of Agriculture for uh, online classes. I'm not even going to attempt that. So, because we do a lot in the field and on Turf Talk Tuesdays every other Tuesday evenings. So, Let's get started with our course objectives. Uh, we're going to talk about ways that pesticides are going to move in the environment. And you may or may not even think about the ways that these uh, pesticides move. I mean, you know, there is leaching, there is, you know, drift. But what about us? What about animals? You know, there's multiple times that I've driven through neighborhoods, guys, that we work in, and you see footprints in the turf and we know what that's from. There's, there's been people out there spraying weeds in the shrub beds and they step in to places that they've sprayed and then they walk across the yard to get back to the truck and you see footsteps. How ridiculous is that? But you see it all the time. These guys are just going to do it. Or you see little spots dripped across the yard. It's a leaking backpack. Um, and so when you have mishaps like that, you know, there is the chance that it, it can get, uh, into, uh, uh, you know, the waterways, it can get into the drains, you know, you've got that leaky backpack, uh, but pesticides are carried by us and they are carried from one site to the other. Think about this, you know. Here it is, March, you know, that I'm recording this lecture. Uh, so, you know, we finished with the Lyme application. We finished with our first round of pre-emergent. And, you know, those bags of fertilizer and the, definitely the Lyme, you're going to get dusty. So you're actually carrying that pesticide residue with you from place to place. You know, you may go into a uh, restaurant for lunch and you know, kind of shake your stuff off. You've left pesticides there in the chair. So uh, pesticides are moved in multiple, multiple ways from site to site. We're going to talk about conditions that cause drift, which is a dangerous, dangerous 
uh, situation. It is scary almost at times to see how uh, little amount of wind or the heat rising during the day that these pesticides can volatize and actually move off site uh, in the wind. Uh, it is against the law to apply a pesticide in conditions that favor drift. So you must, must pay attention uh, to weather conditions, to ground temperatures, to air temperatures, uh, to wind velocity, uh, rain that may be coming in or not. Guys, you do not want to put down um, any type of granular fertilize that when we have a monsoon or a one inch or a hundred year uh, storm come through that's going to wash all this pesticides down into the storm drains and then end up in our creeks. So we have to pay attention uh, to local weather conditions and what it's going to be doing the next day as well. We're going to understand point source and non-point source contamination. Point source meaning, hey, we can pinpoint exactly where we've had that pesticide contamination. We know that there is a spill. You know, it could be at your uh, mixed load site, uh, whereas, you know, you've had leaching go into the soil over multiple times. So we know exactly what's there. Non-point source contamination could be an application that's done miles up the upstream and it's entered our stream and now it's gotten down into a, a larger body of water. We can't pinpoint exactly where that non-point source is. We just know that it has happened. We are also going to explain how solubility, persistence, adsorption, and degradation affect pesticide movement. All three of these are going to affect uh, pesticide movement. We're going to prevent pesticides from entering water sources. We have to protect our water sources, guys. And, you know, unfortunately, us lawn care professionals and farmers, we are given a bad rap because we do have to use pesticides. You know, and I teach a class on pesticide history, and that that really kind of hits home, guys. You know, a third of our crops are going to be lost, you know, just from, from harvest time to transport to actually storage. So when we're growing these crops, you know, about a third of them, we're not even going to be able to eat. So that leaves us about two-thirds of what's actually grown. And if it wasn't for pesticides being used in the fields, we would lose an additional third of our crops. Pesticides feed the world, guys. And I know this is a, a tricky topic to discuss, but we couldn't feed the world if we didn't use pesticides. We have an abundance of food here in the United States, even with losing a third of our pesticides, you know, from storage, harvest, and, and transporting from the fields. You know, a third of them are going to be lost. And an additional one-third could also be lost if we didn't use pesticides. Um, so we've got we've got to uh, uh, to be thankful for these pesticides. You know, they haven't been really used uh, until the mid-1900s, you know, 1950s and stuff. That's whenever it came on. Uh, but pesticides are dated back to 1000 B.C., where they actually burned sulfur uh, to to fumigate homes that they were living in. So pesticides have been around, but they haven't been really in production uh, until, you know, the 1950s. But protect these water sources. Identify sensitive areas. These are areas that we do not want to actually spray any pesticides around. I'm talking about schoolhouses. I'm talking about rest homes. I'm talking about anywhere that there may be uh, people who are more likely to be susceptible to a pesticide exposure, young children, elderly people, um, food processing plants, places that house our feed for our livestock, nurseries, you know, or their young plant material and stuff like that. We don't want to have any pesticides being in there or being around it just in case of that drift, just because of, you know, uh, a monsoon coming through and washing the pesticides down into these areas. We don't want it at all. We're going to explain how pesticides can harm endangered species. You know, again, endangered meaning they're on the brink of extinction. You know, threatened species, you know, they're they're close to being endangered. 
but we need to protect these precious animals. You know, what would happen if all the bees were killed by pesticides? If there's no bees, there's no humans. That's just plain and simple. So with pesticides in the environment, the environment is everything around us, which may include natural or man-made elements. My environment right here recording this lecture is my environment. I'm inside. I'm in my office. I have headphones on. I'm sitting at a, at a drafting uh, desk. I've got my roadcaster. I've got my monitors here that I'm recording this lecture. This is my environment. You may be sitting at the kitchen table or on your couch and your lazy boy with your laptop there watching this lecture. That is your environment at that given moment in time. So environment is everything that's around us. And so what if I'm here working and I have to call my structural press control company because we don't have a structural license. We have ornamentals and turf. And, uh, and, and that's what we specialize in category L in category E. So what if I need to call my structural pest control because I, t I take my dogs everywhere. What if he brought fleas into the office? You know, my environment is the office. He has to fumigate to get rid of the fleas. I have to leave. Same thing. You may be working on a client's backyard, making an application. Well, next door, uh, you could have a client or, you know, you could have the neighbor uh, who has, you know, maybe a small little greenhouse. They have the vents open. You're making an application. It gets warm. We get just a little bit of a breeze. It kills all their vegetables in their greenhouse. That was the environment there. So we have to pay attention to our environment. Wherever we're at, where will these pesticides go after we make the application? What damage could happen from these pesticides to these non-target sites? Guys, we have to pay attention. Pay attention. So many times people call me at the school. They're like, Eric, hey, it's going to get 95 degrees today. You know, should I be spraying this? I'm like, dude, it's, mile, it's 15 mile an hour winds. Why are you even thinking about spraying? You don't want to do it. Plus, yes, 95 degrees is too hot. I'm almost thinking that lawn care needs to be done between like 6 in the morning to like 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe even lunchtime. Stop and then go do something else. Just because of the heat. Just because of the, you know, chances of the wind picking up later afternoon. Volatization. Get that stuff out early. But pay attention. You've got to know what's going on in your environment, no matter where you're at. So drift, this is movement in the air. Wind or air currents will move pesticides away from the target site as vapor or particles. So it can be a moisture that's uplifting and moving off site, or it could be, you know, the dust or actual solid particles that are being carried off by the wind. And that can be scary, guys, scary. Vent systems or these forced air systems can cause drift within the structures. And I've got a story uh, of a situation where uh, one of my students, he was actually a student in the class at the college, and he was telling us about their greenhouse tomatoes. They live in a farm down in Davidson County. And with that, he saw his neighbor making a pesticide application. And with that pesticide application, he went over there and said, look, man, it is way too windy. Can you not make this application? And the neighbor was like, no, I'm going to make the application. I'm going to make the application. I've got to get this done. Now, granted, yes, farmers are on time, time restraints, you know, just like us with our lawn care program, but it was way too windy. The farmer made the application. Well, my student had several greenhouses of greenhouse tomatoes. That was one of their biggest income makers. They were tobacco farmers. They were strawberry farmers, and they had greenhouse tomatoes. The vent system picked up that drift, pulled it through the actual greenhouses, and killed every single one of their tomatoes. It ended up being a big lawsuit. They won, but still, they didn't have the product to sell. Yes, they got reimbursed and, and paid uh, for it, but they'd much rather him not done the application and still been able to provide the tomatoes to their customers. But they went over there and begged him not to do it. And the farmer was like, I'm going to do it. I've got to get it done. But that vent pulled it through. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. And we hear that happen all the time. What about runoff and leaching? 
This is movement in the soil and water. Runoff can carry pesticides to drainage systems, the streams, ponds, and other surface water. You make a granular application, boom, major, major thunderstorm comes through. A 100-year storm washes everything down to the curb and gutter. Next thing you know, it's in the streams. It's in the ponds. It's, it's in the lake. You don't want that to happen. It gets washed maybe into the, the, the neighbor's pool. That is crazy. And I had a client, you know, that actually comes to, to my face-to-face classes, said that their pool was infected by pesticides. The, the neighbor made an application, drift came over, got into the pool, messed up the entire chemistry of the pool. Ended up in a lawsuit. The neighbor was having to pay to remove all the water. They just didn't treat it chemically, but they got all the water out, replaced the water, and then treated the new water. Pesticides and misuse of pesticides can cost us a lot of money. Leaching can carry the pesticide through the soil into subsurface water resources. And that's where we're getting our drinking water. We don't want that to happen. And if we're using a water-soluble pesticide, it's more likely to get down into our water sources below ground. Movement by clothing, equipment, plants, or animals. That's exactly what I was talking about when we started this course. Residues on our clothes. What about the residue of a pesticide can remain after a spill and be transferred by people, plants, or animals? You can even transfer these residues inside your home by bringing in your contaminated clothing. You don't want that to happen. And you, as a business owner, don't want your technicians to go home to a newborn baby, to a sick elderly parent who may be on a respirator, and they get this pesticide on them and in them. And it can actually cause the elderly and the very young to die. Have a place for them to change their clothes, take a shower, rinse off, put on civilian clothes, and then go home. Leave those dirty uniforms there. That's why I'm so adamant about having a uniform service, especially in the lawn care industry. It gives these guys a chance to change before they take that stuff home. You would feel super guilty as the business owner to see those guys go home and and contaminate and expose their children. Properties affecting the movement, degradation, persistence, solubility, absorption, and volatility. We're going to talk about each and every one of these. Degradation is basically the breakdown of the pesticide after it has been applied. They can be broken down by water, bacteria, soil microorganisms, sunlight, plant, and animal metabolism. They're going to be broken down by these things. There, it's what needs to happen, right? But that can also let them move off site because water is breaking it down. The water gets it in it, could move off site. Soil more uh, microorganisms, you know, worms, everything. It's breaking this all down. Sunlight breaks it down. What about persistence? This is when the pesticide remains present and active for a long time, which means it can harm living things in the environment over time and end up as illegal residue in crops. It is very important to prevent the movement of persistent pesticides. Now, usually the EPA is going to term these persistent pesticides because they study it, and it takes you know anywhere from like five to six years, even seven sometimes, for these pesticides to get approved. And what it is, the EPA is studying to see what the persistence is of these pesticides. They're more worried about how how long it's going to remain in the environment. That's usually one of the factors determining whether or not that pesticide is a restricted-use pesticide or a general-use pesticide. They spend time studying that, and the longer it stays in the environment, the more likely it is going to be a restricted-use pesticide, which is only going to be be able to be applied by licensed applicators like ourselves. Solubility. Soluble pesticides dissolve in liquid and are more likely to move in the environment as runoff or through groundwater. So our pesticides that are water soluble are going to get to that groundwater. We may want to use something that is more, uh, you know, oil based. 
Adsorption, the pesticide binds to the soil particle, which slows the movement off-site. Oil-soluble pesticides are more likely to absorb to soil than water-soluble pesticides as well. So we want those chemicals to stay there, bind to those soils. Actually, it's, it's more beneficial to us, right? We're not losing the active ingredient, which is what we're applying to, to take care of that pest. We don't want it to end up in the pond. We don't want it to end up in the creek. We don't want it to end up in Mrs. Smith's pool. We want it to take care of the pest on the target site. Volatility, the tendency of the pesticide to convert into a gas or vapor and then move off site uh, by drift. This happens all the time. And it happens even with Roundup, guys. We're out there using a backpack sprayer and it's 100 degrees. And we're trying to kill weeds. And then we're spraying underneath the dogwoods. We're spraying underneath uh, rose bushes. Boom. You spray it, gas comes up. It's got the active ingredient, glyphosate, in it, and it's going to kill plants. Or if it doesn't kill it, it's going to kill part of it, and it's going to make it look horrible. And you're going to lose that client, and you're going to look like a not so much of a steward of the land. You're going to look kind of dumb. I hate using that word. But we don't want to have a pesticide mishap. We don't want to end up on the news based on a application that we've made. We won't be in business very long, would we? Now you, I love this. Only you can prevent drift. Only you. Study the weather. Know what it's going to do today. Know what it's going to do tomorrow. You can't be putting out these chemicals if we're going to have the monsoon storm. You can't put out these chemicals if it's going to be 95 degrees and we're going to have 15 mile an hour winds. No way. The pesticide applicator is responsible for preventing drift. Check the label for warnings regarding volatility, equipment recommendations, and precautions on the weather. And make sure there is no temperature inversion or wind that will cause drift. That's when that pesticide, uh, when the air temperatures flip. You got the cool air, you know, up top, and the wind's going to be moving faster up up top and we got some you know heat near the ground all that ground's warming up then all of a sudden we have a flip we have the colder air and it comes down and brings some wind you've got that drift that's going to move that off site from the pesticide board regulations related to pesticide drift no person shall apply a pesticide under such conditions that drift from the pesticide or pesticides particles or vapors will result in adverse effects. Pesticide particles means the active ingredient of a pesticide as a liquid, a spray droplet, a granular, a pellet, a dust, or a fumigant. We can't spray or apply anything, guys, if conditions are going to allow drift to happen you can get into serious trouble you could lose your license you could be paying fines you could end up in court and it can cost you a lot of money and your insurance company a lot of money pay attention to the weather they're on these little handy devices that we carry in our back pockets every single day right check the weather with particle drift here we have the small particles of pesticides getting carried away from the application site by air movement. Off-target movement of small particles or drops occurring during or after the application. So, guys, it can happen after you've already left the site. You've made the application. You've punched it into your computer or tablet in the truck. You're feeling good got this job done i'm headed back to the shop all of a sudden it gets 95 degrees you've made that application that spray is starting to volatize and then boom mother nature starts to blow some smoke get some wind going through there and you've moved that pesticide off target not good not good because trust me somebody has seen you spray 
Somebody has seen you spray. That is the bad, bad thing about pulling up in a spray truck. Everybody's going to be watching you. What are they doing? You know what? Best way to get them to even come out, question you and everything is go ahead and put on that Tyvek suit. Wear that respirator. Wear those goggles, the gloves, everything. You're going to look back. You're going to look back to the COVID days, right? People are going to get spooked seeing you dressed up in all that PPE. So reduce particle drift by adjusting your nozzle selection. You know, maybe, maybe, um, uh, change them out, you know, make, make it more of a harder stream versus more of a, you know, wide spray, your boom height, you'd want to lower it, but that's going to change your swath width. Right. And so, you may have to go back and recalibrate when you change your nozzles and your boom height. So kind of goes back to that. Hey, maybe we shouldn't be spraying after a certain time of day. Maybe we it gets like this. We just wait till the next day, but your pressure again, going to have to recalibrate Wind, the wind picks up. Don't spray viscosity. Don't don't temperature gets hot. Don't. Guys, again, all of this, all of this can happen really in the blink. I mean, the weather can change. You know, my, my daughter's at Boone, App State. There's a t-shirt up there, and they had the same t-shirt when I was up there for one year. I went up there for one year. And I didn't leave because of the cold or didn't anything. I left because of of the cologne that some of those people wore, that patchouli oil. You know, which to me, that, hell, that that kills some weeds, right? I couldn't stand that smell. But my daughter's up there, and that T-shirt says, "Where else in the world can you see all four seasons in a day?" Well, that doesn't only not just pertain to Boone, but my goodness, it can happen here, especially in the springtime, right? Wake up, it's cold, no wind moving, <clears throat> rains a little bit. Gets hot in the afternoon, winds pick up. I mean, all kinds of things can happen. We're in North Carolina. So we have to pay attention. We have to pay attention. Here's this temperature inversion. Cool air is trapped at the ground and um, leveled by the warm air. So the air moves horizontally instead of vertically. Um, here you have, you know, the warming land. Land starts to cool off or whatever. And as you can see, you know, the higher you get up, you have that wind profile going across. All right. As that inversion happens, you're getting that cooler air. So you've got more wind moving closer to the ground. Not good. Not good. Now, look at this diagram as well. Here you have vapor drift. And again, this is even days after the application. You've made the application here, maybe to soybeans. You've got wind moving up top. Everything's going to volatize. It's going to rise up. And then you're going to have drift come over, and it's hitting the non-target sensitive crop, such as corn. This is movement of a gaseous vapor or even particles whether they're liquid particles or even a granular or dust particle, it can happen through the wind. That is your drift. Point source solution or point source pollution. This is a source of pollution that is single and identified as a place or a vent. Spill at the mixing site. You're mixing up everything, putting it in your tank. You have a mishap. You know it happened right then and there. Spilled wash water at a cleanup. You're washing out your tanks. You have a spill. You have improper handling of the spill. You didn't do it correctly. Improper disposal of containers. You didn't triple rinse and then put them where they need to be put. Back siphoning into a well water. Now that, my friends, shouldn't happen. For one... If you're filling up with the well, even city water, guys, you gotta you gotta have that air gap in between the tank and the hose. But never have your guys fill up at your clients' houses. I've seen that. I've seen guys mixing up a 500 gallon tank there with their 
customer's hose and they just drop the hose in the tank. You can't do that. Definitely, if they're on a well, that could back siphon in it, and that their 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 water source is contaminated. What about contaminated runoff? You make an application, you get that monsoon, that granular fertilizer you just put out did not break down; it washed off, and it is going in to the stormwater system, and you can see it. Nine point. This is source of pollution is after a broad application. Runoff from a lawn, field, golf course, right away, carries the pesticides into the streams, river ponds, or other surface. Because this can happen way up there, way up there. You know, if it's yours, you can you can pinpoint it. But if something just happens, you look down in your lake and you see dead fish, and you're like, well, what the heck's going on? I haven't made an application. My my turf grass guy hadn't been here, but the neighbor five miles up the road did, and the pesticides got in this, the creek that dumps into your pond that you've got fish in. Now you don't have any fish. That is a non-point source pollution. You can't really identify where it happened. And remember, runoff is at maximum during and directly after heavy rain. So again, it's not your lawn. You don't know where it came from. You can't pinpoint it. But this can happen miles up the road, miles up the stream. Surface water. Usually a source of drinking water, so contamination is a health concern. Rate of runoff and erosion depends on slope. If there is a ground cover or buffer zone, Soil characteristics, particle size, and amount of organic matter, and amount and intensity of rainfall. And so, guys, what we're thinking about there, we got surface water. We got we got a pond, you know, and I'm thinking about, you know, Lake Bryant, all the lakes around here, you know, that is drinking water. You know, they may collect it and they may run it through filter, you know, filter systems or whatever. You know, here, you know, we have the Yakin River and the water treatment plant is just down the street. I mean, we could we could walk over to it to the Yakin River, where the drinking water comes for a lot of Winston Salem. If it was to get contaminated with a pesticide, what do you think is going to happen? A lot of people could get sick because the Yakin River runs through look how many counties, counties that are agricultural, that grow a lot of field crops, that are putting out a lot of fertilizer, that are putting out a lot of pesticides. And we've yet to have an issue. Again, why? Farmers are just like us. We're stewards of the land. We do things the right way. I call the individual that doesn't pay attention to the label and where is PPE and all that stuff who doesn't have a pesticide license. They're yahoos. They're out there doing the work illegally, not following the label, putting out pesticides, wrong time of the year, wrong time when weather's on its way, when it's too hot, when it's too windy. They're just trying to get stuff done. Yahoos. Groundwater. Underground water in the bedrock, which is a source for wells and springs. 70% of public water supply is groundwater. Groundwater. I'm on a well here. I don't want my well contaminated. So correcting groundwater contamination can be almost impossible. It's, it's not going to happen, guys. It's not. But right here, you know, we got the surface water. Like a lot of cities, a lot of cities use surface water for drinking water. Out in the country here, we're using wells. We're we're digging. We're getting down into that groundwater, tapping into it. We don't want it contaminated. We don't want either one contaminated. Leaching. Pesticide is more likely to leach into the groundwater if it is water-soluble, persistent, slow in breaking down non-toxic compounds, and non-absorptive. can get very, very uh, tricky there, my friends. You don't want anything to leach down in there. You're going to kill crops. You're going to kill your plants. You could kill your turf grass. You could get into uh, your, your, your groundwater. Very, very troublesome times for the applicator. All right, so 
protecting water. We need to handle our pesticides safely. We need to apply only when necessary and in adequate amounts. I do a whole lecture on applying the correct amount of pesticide. You know, is too much or too little of a pesticide detrimental to the environment and our checkbooks? Well, both of them are. If we don't get enough pesticide to kill the target pest, we're going to have to go back and make another application. And at that time, we're probably already putting out too much, plus the time that it takes us to go back and do it. We're putting way too much pesticide out if we apply too little and have to go back. If we apply too much in the first place, we're hurting our checkbook, and we could be hurting our turf grass. We could be hurting the plant material that's around it. You have to apply the correct amount and only when it is necessary. And that, my friends, incorporates what we call integrated pest management. I don't like it when lawn care companies mix several pesticides in one tank. I'd much rather push my food, push out my fertility, and spot spray my weeds. You got companies that are mixing, you know, a liquid fertility, and then they're putting in a pre-emergent. Yeah, that's that's okay. But what about when they mix in that broadleaf with it? And they're broadcasting the entire lawn. Well, I'm sorry. If somebody's on my lawn care program, they shouldn't have weeds. So I shouldn't have to be applying much of any type of post-emergent broadleaf weed control. It's just not going to happen, right? So if I do have some weeds, I want to spot spray them. That's what I was just talking about. Spotter ban treatments reduce the amount applied. Select your products wisely. Study up on this. I love it when we do Turf Talk Tuesday because I got guys from all over the country. I got guys from all over North Carolina, and they're talking about the products that they use that we may not necessarily have on our shelves here at Site One or at Green Resource. So I'm 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 learning from those guys. I'm learning these new products and and saying, hey, this worked. And you know, you know, that rate was a little too low. If you bumped it up just a little bit, you know, I was talking to my ag agent and they said to do this, and it worked. We learn so much from each other, and I love it when I hear about a new product. Calibrate and regularly check your equipment for leaks. You got to. You got to. Calibration every single morning. Calibration when you change your pesticide. Calibration when you change from property to property. Not meaning neighbor to neighbor, but if you're going from flat yards to hilly yards like we have here in the Piedmont, you've got to recalibrate your equipment. What about if you go to Subway and you eat a 12-inch hoagie instead of a salad? What do you think is happening to your ground speed walking? Going way down. What's happening to that application rate? It's going way up. The slower you walk, the more product you're putting out. Recalibrate. Follow the label and do not exceed the rates. They might give you a range. That's what I was talking about while ago. They said, you know, three to five ounces or whatever. Um, three ounces isn't doing it. But if you used four, you're still in that three to five range, right? We're learning from each other. But read the label. I like getting pulled over by the pesticide cop, as we call it, the ag agents. Hey, man, what are you spraying? And I can go, blah, 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 blah. And I start s just spitting out the label, right? It's because I set up all night and I read it. If I'm spraying something new, I'm reading the label. If I'm spraying something and it's been a year since I've done it since the last application last year, I'm reading the label. I want to know what's going on. I want it fresh on my mind. The label is the law. Sweep or blow the granulars from surfaces back onto the treated area only. So you get a little bit on the driveway, just blow it off. Push it up into the push it up into the area that you just made the treatment to. Don't blow it in the neighbors. Don't blow it down into the curb and gutter. That's wrong. And immediately contain and control all spills. Oh. Identify vulnerable areas. Be aware of the streets, sewers, drains, ditches where runoff may carry pesticides to the waterways and don't dump or rinse into the storm drain. And my God, I've seen people do it. They're rinsing out their backpack and dumping it down 
the curb and gutter. And I'm like, what are you doing? Again, Yahoo. Let me see that pesticide license. What are you, what are you doing? I ain't got a new pesticide license. I ain't got to have one. I ain't giving the state $75 a year. We hear that all the time, don't you? I ain't, I ain't got no landscape contract license. Man, that called me 100 bucks a year. Do not mix near water or wells. Mix pesticides at least 50 feet away from the wells, lakes, streams, rivers, and storm drains. And, and my, my friends, I want to be a lot further away than 50 feet because that ain't, that ain't but like four and a half of me's. If I was to lay down, that's too close to it. I'm talking about let's get like 50 yards. Try to always mix and load at the application site. Cannot be done all the times. I don't want my technicians mixing and loading at the client's house. If you've got to fill up that 500 gallon tank, come back to the shop. We got a safe place for you to do that. We're not going to do it in the driveway of our client's house. No way. Sealed permanent or portable mixing and loading pads prevent seepage into the soil. Absolutely. Have you a little retaining wall where you can drive in, close that off. Have it where it will contain that spill if you have it, where you can, where you can able to clean it up. And then you got your little Home Depot shed or Lowe shed there. I love these big box little, uh, little sheds that you can get. That's the perfect thing to store these pesticides in because they've got windows. You can get ventilation. You can put in an air conditioner. You can put in a heater in there. You can put lights. Good place to store it. Avoid the back siphoning. Reverse flow of liquids into the fuel hose happens all the time. You got to have this airspace right here, guys, an air gap, even a check valve on the hose. Do not do this. It is going to go back, and it is going to get into whatever resource or source of water that you're pulling from. Prevention means leaving the air gap between the discharge end of the water and the tank. Crazy stuff. Sensitive areas. These are areas where people, plants, and animals and or habitats could be injured by the pesticides. And here, I, I can see it happening. You see all these kids on the playground and stuff, and you see a Yahoo pull up with a spray truck, gets out. Man, this is on the route sheet. I got to get it done. Out there spraying and the wind blowing. And these little kids are like, man, I can taste it. What is the teacher, that's nasty. Don't do it, guys. Don't do it. You shouldn't even be spraying around the schoolhouse. Playgrounds, daycares, nursing homes, hospitals, recreational areas. Stay away for it. Stay away from them. These are outdoor sensitive areas. No pesticides near it. Habitats where endangered or threatened species reside. Honeybee hops, parks, wildlife refuge, where domestic animals or livestock are kept. Your food, feed, and nursery crops. Public gardens and, and playing fields. What if you were to go by uh, a nursery that's out there, got everything out on the on the ground? It's warm enough now, and you're out there just 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 going to go ahead and start killing everything. Going to start over. Wind blowing twenty mile an hour goes in there, and all that drift hits all those new plants that that nursery man or nursery woman's put out there. They ain't gonna like you, but their attorney will. Indoor sensitive areas, food or feed processing centers, where confined animals live or eat, places where ornamental plants are grown, even the malls, guys. You know, they got indoor plants. You know, you're outside making an application, AC and all that comes on, they're exchanging the air, boom, and plants ain't happy. Protect the bees, read the label, apply pesticides in the evening or early morning when the bees are not active. Don't spray when the crops are blooming and use spot treatments instead of broad applications. Always, always. And yes, if these bees die, they are going to take us with them. The difference between endangered and threatened. Okay, endangered, brink of extinction. Threatened, likely to become endangered in the near future. You got to stay away from them. You can't go spraying around these endangered or threatened species. Now, 
North Carolina does have a program in cooperation with Environmental Protection Agency to protect endangered and threatened species from being harmed by pesticides. You need to read it. Go to the EPA's website. They've got the bulletins to find pesticide use restrictions. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.epa.gov forward slash endangered dash species. Check it out. Guys, we don't want to end up on the news because of a mishap that we've done or our technicians done. And I was asked the other night in Turf Talk Tuesday, they said, Eric, if one of our employees who has their own pesticide license has a mishap, he's working for us, are we liable for it too? Absolutely. Yes. The company and the technician are uh, 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 responsible for it. Just like if we were to have a wreck, our pesticide truck, you know, runs into the back of somebody because your, your, your technician was texting and then the, the car behind him hits them. If they can prove that he was on the phone and everything else, and then that 500 gallon tank bust, and you got all this pesticide going down into the curb and gutter, and then you got the news camera and you got everybody over there filming it, you're going to end up on the news real quick. Eric Jones, technician, lawn care, truck broke down in a wreck, all that. That'd be when the pesticides all foamy and nasty and it would just look bad, wouldn't it? That would be my problem. That'd be my problem. So we got some review questions, just kind of what we're going over. You'll probably see this on the quiz to actually get your proof of attendance as well. But what characteristics of a pesticide makes it more likely to move with water in surface run off? So go back and think about that. A, is it high solubility? Remember while we talked about high solubility, that it is more susceptible? What about high absorption? Eh, probably not, because that means it's going to actually be sticking to the soil particles, right? What about high volatil uh, volatility? Not with surface runoff, maybe more you know, with vapor volatizing and moving upwards. Same thing with the tendency to evaporate quickly has really nothing to do with surface runoff. So the answer is A, high solubility. High solubility. Which of these may be a cause of non-point source pollution? Remember, non-point. There's, there's also point source. This is non-point source. Back siphoning of a pesticide spills at a wellhead. Well, no, actually, we, we can pinpoint that there. What about leaching from a pesticide mixing area? Hmm, probably not. I mean, because we know we're at a mixed load site. What about pesticides that dissolve and leach through the soil after a rainfall and ends up in the underground stream moving off? Maybe. Or what about dumping leftover pesticide products down a well? No, you caught Mr. Yahoo doing that. The ring doorbell got got that. Saw that technician dumping it in your in your well out there. Not a good thing. So the answer is C: pesticides that dissolve and leach through the soil after a rainfall. Which statement is true about protecting bees from pesticide injury? Wettable powders are the safest. Maybe, maybe not. B, is it best to spray the crops in bloom? No. What do you think bees are out there doing? They're impregnating those flowers, right? Flower to flower. They want the blooms. Aerial applications are less hazardous. We, we didn't say one thing about aerial apps, did we? Applying pesticides in the evening or during the early morning is recommended. Absolutely. That's when the bees are less hazardous. Active. So the answer is D. Applying pesticides in the evening or during the early morning is recommended. Now, number four, what label statement will be on a pesticide's 
that might harm endanger what label statement will be on pesticides that might harm endangered species. Now we didn't really jump into this, so I'm gonna go ahead and help you with this, but I, I wanna let's let's talk about the four answers. Advice to consult county bulletin to determine what special precautions to take when using the product. Advice to consult a local conservation officer for a permit to apply the pesticide. We're going to have to go through the Department of Ag. We're not going to go through a conservation office for permits. A ban on the use of the pesticide in all areas where endangered species might be harmed. Probably not. A list of endangered species that might be harmed by the pesticide. No. You're going to have to consult the county bulletin to determine what special precautions to take when using the product. So the answer is A, and that is directly out of, you know, our manuals to get our pesticide licensings. And so, guys, that concludes our course, Pesticide in the Environment and Landscape, course number 268 through. That will get you one landscape contractor, landscape, or technical credit for licensing renewal period ending July 31st, 2024. So if you've taken it between August 1st, 2023 and between July 31st of 2024, it will count for your license renewal uh, starting August 1st, 2024. So anyway, guys, I appreciate it. Glad that you were able to join us for this uh, course, and I will see you in the next lecture.